Hi, my name is Paul DeLon. I'm a professor of environmental soil science with Texas A&M AgriLife Research at Vernon. You heard earlier from my co-author, Dr. Katie Lewis. I've been asked today to discuss cover crop benefits and cattle grazing, and I appreciate the opportunity to share some of the results we've seen thus far. So the research I will be sharing is from the Texas Rolling Plains region, similar environment, a little bit wetter environment compared to the Southern High Plains, but we do have a highly variable climate where we seem here lately to be getting, be getting very heavy precipitation events, followed by extended hot and dry conditions has been the norm over the last few years. Monoculture dryland cropping systems um, are predominant, those being wheat and cotton systems. So why are we talking about cover crops. Interest was sparked with the release of the NRCS Soil Health Initiative in 2012, where five principles to improve soil health were introduced. The fifth principle, livestock integration, uh, piqued a lot of interest in our region for our producers um, as dual-use wheat systems are prevalent and are important to the livelihoods of producers in the Texas Rolling Plains. Some key questions we're trying to answer. One, are cover crops viable? What's the production potential of cover crops? Should we even be talking about cover crops? The main concern be soil water use. If we're growing um, <coughs> cover crops, particularly in dry land conditions, is that going to utilize precious soil water and take away from our cash crop production? With cover cropping, you know, how much is that uh, going to cost, especially for these multi-species mixtures that are being recommended? You know, does it pencil out? And then when to graze and how much to graze? And as the, so this initiative was rolled out, there are a lot of questions about grazing and, and restrictions on grazing. And, and the recommendation was flab grazing or mob grazing, a high density, short duration grazing um, period that was close to termination of the cover crop with the goal of leaving a good amount of that residue um, behind on the soil surface. So the question became, if you graze more than maybe was recommended, do you still see soil health benefits under these different scenarios? So to answer question number one about cover crop production potential, water use efficiency, you know, Dr. Wayne Keeling had done some cover crop research, interseeding in cotton in the late 80s, early 90s, and found uh, fairly good success for some species. So we evaluated this at Chillicothe also. In recent years, looking at Austrian winter pea, hairy vetch, and a mixture including cereal rye along with the species you see there, wheat and crimson clover. And over a six year average, we found that pea vetch in, in a mixture were our best producers. The mixture is being dominated by cereal rye. And one, um, these cover crops were seeded after cotton harvest, so later than optimum. Um, they were seeded from last week of October through mid-December. Also, these plots have not received any fertility application since the inception. And we're using lower than recommended seeding rates, or it was at that time, um, for the wheat and the mixture being about 30 pounds per acre. And water use efficiency um, was very similar to biomass production. Um, high, you know, no differences between a mixture and some of our best performing monospecies um, and legumes. So then stored soil water was a big concern. So this is stored soil water in dry land system in the top 24 inches. So the red and the orange line being conventional till and no-till without cover crops. The green line being crimson clover, the blue being wheat cover crop, which they did not produce as much biomass as the other. The top biomass producers vetch pea in the mixture using the most soil water. So this isn't rocket science. This is at time of termination. So very vigorous growth over the last six weeks, mid-March to late April and use soil water. However, when we received a rain in May, you can see that the change in stored soil water changed from about 75 to 140 millimeters, so nearly three inches um, of, of soil water was um, captured during that rainfall event or those rainfall events. Whereas with the, without cover crops, that infiltration or the stored soil water changed by about an inch. So we saw higher infiltration rates or water capture where we had the cover crop species. So as Dr. Lewis showed some of this data, we see the same thing in the rolling plains. 
Yes, we use um, stored soil water. However, uh, we're recapturing that due to enhanced soil health, um, soil function, and water holding capacity and capture um, with the cover crop systems. Well, Texas lags in the adoption of conservation tillage. As low as 16% of cropped acres have been reported. A recent survey showed that wheat acres comprise the majority of acreage under conservation tillage in the southeast U.S. at about 65% of acres being under um, conservation tillage compared to 40% for cotton acres. In the southern Great Plains, that dips below um, 30% in the southern Great Plains for cotton acres. So initially, adoption of no-till was hindered due to concerns of grazing no-till systems. So we conducted a study looking at um, graze out in the black bars versus the graze grain at different times of the year. So soon after graze out in um, June of each year, um, graze out showed higher runoff volumes and lower infiltration rates compared to the graze grain system. However, once we um, entered into the fall prior to wheat planting, um, those effects were no longer apparent. So we saw no long-term effects of grazing, even graze out conditions. Um, on um, soil compaction or runoff infiltrate runoff rates and infiltration rates. So the assumption was that progressive farmers um, who implemented no-till would probably be the first to also adopt um, some cover crop strategies, which have proven to be true. And that gave us the opportunity to evaluate warm season cover crops during the summer fallow between annual wheat crops and the potential for grazing. So this is a picture um, a farmer's field who had a cool season cropping system and this was a wheat canola rotation and this was after a um, failed canola crop so he planted a mixed species warm season cover crop in uh, May of 2014 so July 2014 this is a picture of in his field concerned about pulling out too much soil water using that cover crop so he terminated the cover crop July 8th 2014 so six months later this is the picture in the same field in the wheat stand in that field as you can see very little residue and that's one of the things about terminating cover crop and vegetative stage it degrades very rapidly but this led to a question of what are we doing by terminating cover crop leaving it in the field and what soil health benefits are we getting I mean there's no residue there did we miss opportunity could we have grazed this field or harvest this field um, for a hay crop and see the same soil health benefits so this led to um, a study evaluating that, looking at a mixed species um, cover crop, seeing that mixed species um, come up and then graze the cover crop um, prior to chemical termination. And this would be August of the year. And then after termination, drilling our wheat straight into that uh, standing residue. Stored soil water in this system in the top 24 inches at cover crop termination, these would uh, top two lines of black and green are both no-till systems without a cover crop. This is a conventional till and this had been no-till for 12 years entering this study and we reverted back to conventional tillage. So after about six tillage operations over the course of three summers, um, we see an impact on soil moisture by reverting back to conventional till. However, uh, these bottom four lines are uh, mixed species warm season cover crop treatments. Again, Cover crops are growing, um, they're uptaking um, soil water to grow. However, as we saw in the cool season with cotton systems, um, prior to wheat planting, and we were getting back to kind of status quo among all treatments and seeing um, a larger recharge rate with the cover crops compared to what we were seeing without cover crops. Aggregate stability. Um, from different systems, conventional till and no-till without a cover crop versus no-till with a cover crop and no-till with a grazed cover crop. So this grazing was a flash grazing, say 15 cow pairs on one acre of land over a 24 hour period. Large macro aggregates see uh, increase with um, cover crops over conventional tillage. And what's com what conventional tillage is doing is really destroying our aggregation. And saw this with small uh, macros as well. Um, decreased small macros, um, tillage is increasing the small macro as it breaks up the larger macros. Mean weight diameter, the larger the number, the more stable aggregates. So with 
grazing or ungrazed cover crops, um, we saw more stable aggregates or higher mean weight diameter than we saw with um, conventional tillage. One of the reasons we were looking at grazing cover crops was to see if we could recoup some of the costs associated with implementing cover crops. So we conducted a um, study and looked at net returns. So here we have conventional till without a cover crop and no-till without a cover crop. So this is also a no-till without a cover crop that has um, radishes or turnips intercropped with the wheat. But our no-till with ungrazed cover crops would be the third bars and um, our sixth bar over here. And then our grazed cover crops are right in the middle of the screen and over at um, the last set of bars. But for each year, we see that our grazed cover crops had higher net returns than our ungrazed um, cover crops. And in most years, there were no difference between um, our grazed cover crops and our no-till systems, our standard systems. But grazing cover crops, based upon our economic analysis, increased net return by 38 to $44 per acre compared to non-grazed cover crops. So by grazing cover crops, we did recoup some of the costs associated with implementing um, that if compared to if we did not graze the cover crops at all. So how does this impact soil health? So we looked at um, some microbial and active carbon um, variables based upon um, termination timing and, um, and method. So this is a fallow, summer fallow system. This is warm season cover crops. Um, early versus a late termination for mung beans versus cowpeas and then a multi-species mixture and this is an early versus a late so allowing that to go about 30 days longer and then a hade where we remove the above ground biomass but as you can see with microbial biomass if you focus on the mixtures um, by letting the the cover crop grow longer so higher more microbial biomass and by removing the above ground biomass did not appear to affect the microbial um, the microbial biomass so the below ground activity, the, the root mass and, and the growth of that stimulated microbial biomass. And so it's important to think about what's going on below ground as, as uh, well as above ground. Saw the same pattern for um, bacterial biomass. We did not see the same pattern for um, active carbon where we saw removing um, the, bi the above, above ground biomass for the mixture and did result in a little bit lower um, active carbon compared to the uh, mixtures that were terminated and left in the field. So as this indicated, for some soil health parameters, um, removing the above ground biomass would not necessarily hinder our soil health. So an update on some current studies. You know, I've talked about providing alternative grazing opportunities. You know, I've talked about the supplemental grazing of a warm season cover crop and wheat systems. So we're also looking at grazing cool season um, cover crops in early fall, as well as the potential of grazing out cool season cover crops in the spring. So integrating cover crops and livestock into cotton systems or cotton wheat rotations. So trying to graze after cotton harvest. So in order to do this, the data I've shown so far has been about broad or drilling cover crops after cotton harvest, which does not give you any fall forage. So we'd have to look at broadcasting or interseeding. Um, to be honest, we've done some broadcasting um, in two or three different studies over the last couple of years, and we have not had success. One with just stand establishment, and then in one scenario when we did have stand establishment in the irrigated system, um, it turned um, very hot and dry, and those cover crops um, did not survive. So cover crop selection um, is another thing to think about if you're going to use harvest aid uh, management, if you have a mixed species and then you apply a harvest aid, then that may compromise um, some things in your mixture. That's an example of summer grazing in 2020 of a warm season cover crop between wheat crops. In this study, we looked at two seeding rates of 25 and 50 pounds per acre. And so you can see we've produced about the same biomass between those seeding rates. Now this has been observed um, in Lubbock region with Dr. Keeley and Dr. Lewis showing that 
Um, 30 pounds and 60 pounds of wheat and rye produce about the same amount of biomass. We've seen the same thing here in Vernon with pea, vetch, and rye, where reduced seeding rates being a quarter or half X rate, producing um, similar biomass as a one X or one and a half X rate. So potential to reduce seeding rates and produce similar biomass. And we've seen this in wet and dry years, although this was a drier year, um, as you can see in a below average biomass production. This is a picture of grazing of those systems, eight one acre plots. We had 40 cow calf pairs, a little bit more intensive um, stocking density over a longer period of time, over about a week period. So our goal is to provide um, a longer duration grazing period throughout the season. 2020 didn't really allow that. We really just um, looked to terminate that cover crop and we took more biomass off than what we had in past studies. And this is the resulting picture after grazing and chemical termination, planting um, wheat into the standing um, biomass that remained. So um, this would be our go with cotton also is to have a stand uh, or planting in early September and then being able to graze after cotton harvest. In conclusion, cover crops produce measurable biomass each year of our evaluated studies. Flash grazing had no adverse effects on stored soil moisture, infiltration, or soil properties compared to other conservation approaches, although we were removing 45 to 65% of the cover crop biomass um, through grazing. The initial economic analysis indicated that grazing cover crops can provide some return for the cover crop cost, particularly when compared to the non-grazed um, cover crop treatments. So cover crop seeding approach, cover crop species, selection and grazing duration and intensity um, definitely warrant further evaluation within um, the harsh environments and semi-arid environments that we um, reside in. So with that, I'd be um, glad to take any questions as we have time, or please feel free to contact me um, anytime um, to discuss anything that you saw here today or just anything in general to do with um, grazing and cover crops. But again, uh, thanks for the opportunity and thank you for your time.